This video is going to take an introductory look at these things called the hyperbolic trig functions. So we're going to answer the question, how do we do calculus with the hyperbolic trig functions? Hyperbolic trig functions, what are those? Let's introduce those, because this is probably the first time many of you have seen the hyperbolic functions. And these functions come up in applications around things like water waves, vibrations of electronic membranes, also a hanging cable, like a catenary cable. These functions are very useful. and they are all related to trigonometry. In fact, the trig that you know and have seen up to this point, trig is based on the unit circle and the equation for the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1. And when we do x squared plus y squared equals 1, we end up with this circle with a radius of 1. And for any point on that circle, the x value is equal to what we call the cosine, and the y value is equal to what we call the sine. And then all of trigonometry is built on this unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1, where x and y are the cosine and the sine. Well, hyperbolic trig. is based on the unit hyperbola, hence the name. So we're still doing x squared, y squared, and 1. But now it looks at what happens if x squared minus y squared is equal to 1. When we do x squared minus y squared equals to 1, we end up with this hyperbola shape. And at any point in this hyperbola, we're going to define the x value as being the hyperbolic cosine of the angle and the y value to be the hyperbolic sine of the angle. And that generates a whole new type of trigonometry with several new relationships that are very helpful in these applications with water waves, vibrations of electronic membranes, and other physics applications. And in this whole new trigonometry that we can work with, we actually do have all six trig functions that you're used to seeing. So let's define clearly the six hyperbolic trig functions. We've already seen the first two, the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine. And it turns out that we can actually convert these two expressions using the exponential e to the x. The hyperbolic cosine ends up being equal to e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. And the hyperbolic sine is the exact same thing, just with a minus sign in the middle, e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. When it comes time to define the hyperbolic tangent, we can use the same relationship from circular trig, where tangent is equal to sine divided by cosine. So we'll take the hyperbolic sine divided by the hyperbolic cosine. Well, if we do that, the denominators of divide by 2 divide out, and we're just left with e to the x minus e to the negative x over e to the x plus e to the negative x. In addition to the three basic hyperbolic trig functions, we also have the reciprocal functions. So the reciprocal of cosine is secant, same with hyperbolic. The hyperbolic secant is equal to 1 over the cosine hyperbolic or the reciprocal of the hyperbolic cosine. So that would be 2 over e to the x plus e to the negative x. The hyperbolic cosecant 
is the reciprocal of a hyperbolic sine. So we just flip that fraction over, and we get 2 over e to the x minus e to the negative x. And the hyperbolic cotangent is equal to 1 over the tangent hyperbolic. Or another way you could think about it is it's equal to the hyperbolic cosine divided by the hyperbolic sine. You get the same thing either way. You get e to the x plus e to the negative x over e to the x minus e to the negative x. Now we can do all the trig that we saw back in trigonometry with these hyperbolic trig functions. The formulas are very much the same, slight differences on occasion. But we're interested in calculus of the hyperbolic functions. So we're going to jump straight to doing calculus with these hyperbolic functions. We're going to start with calculating derivatives of the hyperbolic functions. And for the first one, we're going to derive the first one to see where the formula comes from. And then the derivations of the other five are pretty identical, so I'll leave that for you to do on your own, and I'll just give you the formulas. We're going to look at the derivative of hyperbolic cosine. Now you might guess, since the derivative of cosine is negative sine, the derivative of hyperbolic cosine might be negative hyperbolic sine. Let's see if that hypothesis holds true or if it's similar to that result. Well, hyperbolic cosine, we've already said, is equal to e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. And that over 2 is really a constant. So we can pull it out in front of the derivative. So we're really doing the derivative of e to the x plus e to the negative x, which is e to the x minus e to the negative x. And we've got that over 2 out front. So I'll put that all the way through. But what's interesting about this final result, e to the x minus e to the x over 2, that's exactly equal to the hyperbolic sine of x. And so it turns out the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is positive hyperbolic sine. In fact, you'll see a similar result happen as we look at the formulas for all of the hyperbolic derivatives. They follow much the same pattern we would expect. The only minor difference is going to be the signs. So something to be very careful of is the signs are slightly different in hyperbolic trig than they are in regular circular trig. So the derivative of cosine hyperbolic, we already found out, is sine hyperbolic. Following much the same process, if you took the derivative of hyperbolic sine, you'll end up with hyperbolic cosine, also positive. And if you take the derivative of hyperbolic tangent, you'll end up with hyperbolic secant squared. For the reciprocal functions, though, this is where the negatives are going to come in. The reciprocal of cosine was secant. So hyperbolic secant's derivative is negative hyperbolic secant hyperbolic tangent. The derivative of cosecant hyperbolic, which is the reciprocal of sine, turns out to be negative cosecant hyperbolic hyperbolic cotangent. And finally, the derivative of hyperbolic cotangent is equal to negative hyperbolic cosecant squared. So with regular derivatives on the circle, the cos were all negatives. With hyperbolic trig, the reciprocals are all negative. Don't get those signs mixed up. But other than that, the formula should look pretty identical to what we've seen before. Based on that, we should be able to solve any derivative problem involving the hyperbolic trig using the derivative formulas that we've seen back from Calc 1. Let's do the derivative of hyperbolic tangent of x squared times the natural log 
of hyperbolic secant. Well, as you look at this, I hope you notice that it is a product rule. The product rule works just like always. The derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. So the derivative of hyperbolic tangent. The derivative of hyperbolic tangent is hyperbolic secant squared of the stuff. But then the chain rule says we also need to multiply by the derivative of the stuff, which is 2x. Derivative of the first times the second, natural log of hyperbolic secant, plus then we'll take the derivative of the second part. The derivative of the natural log is 1 over the stuff, hyperbolic secant, times the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of hyperbolic secant is negative hyperbolic secant hyperbolic tangent of x. Now that we've taken the derivative of the second part, don't forget we still have to multiply by the first part, the hyperbolic tangent of x squared. We can do a little bit of reducing those hyperbolic secants divide out. Also, when we add a negative, that's going to turn into subtraction. So for our final answer, 2x hyperbolic secant squared of x squared times the natural log of hyperbolic secant minus the hyperbolic tangent times the hyperbolic tangent of x squared. Just like we can do derivatives with the hyperbolic trig, we can also do integrals of the hyperbolic trig functions. Let's do two examples of these. Let's find the integral of x hyperbolic cosine of x squared dx. Well, integration is going to work exactly the same way it's always worked. This is a u substitution problem. If u was x squared, du would be 2x dx, which means we're going to multiply by 2 and 1 half. When we do that, the 2x dx all becomes a du. We've got a 1 half out front. And then we've got the hyperbolic cosine of the x squared becomes a u. All we have to think about then is whose derivative is hyperbolic cosine? We know that's hyperbolic sine with a 1 half out front plus c. And of course, we substitute that u back, so we get 1 half hyperbolic sine of x squared plus c for our final answer. Let's do another problem. Let's find the antiderivative of hyperbolic tangent. Now, just like we can't integrate tangent in regular circular tangent, Hyperbolic tangent we can't integrate, but we can write tangent as hyperbolic sine over hyperbolic cosine. And if that's the case, then we're set up to do a u substitution, where u can be that denominator, the hyperbolic cosine. And du, its derivative, is hyperbolic sine dx. Now my integral. The 1 over sine dx all becomes du, and the hyperbolic cosine of the denominator becomes u, which means our antiderivative is the natural log of u plus a constant. And all we have to do to finish this is plug that u back in, the natural log of hyperbolic cosine plus c becomes our final answer. So really, integration and derivatives work exactly the same with hyperbolic trig functions. We just have to know what the derivatives are of the six hyperbolic functions. Before we wrap up, though, I want to also throw at you the formulas that would come up for the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. 
just like we have formulas for cosine inverse, sine inverse, tangent inverse, secant inverse, we also have inverse hyperbolic trig derivatives. And they can be derived in much the same way. Let's just list them out here, though. The derivative of hyperbolic cosine inverse turns out to be 1 over the square root of x squared minus 1. The derivative of hyperbolic sine inverse, don't forget the h, is 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared or x squared plus 1. The derivative of hyperbolic tangent inverse is 1 over 1 minus x squared. The derivative of hyperbolic secant, hyperbolic inverse, is negative 1 over x times the square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative of hyperbolic cosecant inverse of x is negative 1 over the absolute value of x times the square root of 1 plus x squared. And finally, the derivative of cotangent hyperbolic inverse is 1 over 1 minus x squared, which you might notice something interesting. Tan hyperbolic tangent inverse and hyperbolic cotangent inverse have the exact same derivative. Those formulas are going to create a special case that we're going to have to look at that's related to their domains when we get to their antiderivatives. Now, I'm not going to spend time in this video doing derivatives with these inverse hyperbolic trig functions because the processes and the patterns work exactly the same as all the derivatives we've seen before in this class. So I'm going to allow you to practice these on your own in the assignment. It's just six more formulas to keep track of. But once you have the formulas down, the process of taking a derivative never changes. Then let's talk about those integrals. The integrals of the hyperbolic trig functions, as you might expect, are just the derivative formulas backwards. So the integral of 1 over the square root of u squared minus 1 du would be equal to the hyperbolic cosine inverse of u plus c. The integral of 1 over the square root of 1 plus u squared du would be equal to the hyperbolic sine inverse of u plus c. Jumping over to the reciprocal functions, the integral of 1 over u square root of 1 minus u squared du is equal to the negative hyperbolic secant inverse of the absolute value of u plus c. And that negative just accounts for the fact that we didn't put the negative into the integral formula. If the integral had a negative on top, this would be a positive. Same thing with the cosecant hyperbolic inverse. The integral of 1 over u times the square root of 1 plus u squared du, because we're dropping the negative from the general formula, is negative cosecant hyperbolic inverse absolute value of u plus c. Those four are straightforward. The one you have to be careful of is the integral of 1 over 1 minus u squared du. Because its answer changes based on the value of u. It's going to be tangent, hyperbolic tangent inverse of u plus c if the absolute value of u is less than 1. In other words, it's a decimal between negative 1 and 1. It becomes hyperbolic cotangent inverse of u plus c if the absolute value of u is greater than 1. So we have to be careful which one we use based on our domain. Again, though, integration patterns and processes still work exactly the same as integration has always worked. So rather than me doing a bunch of examples of these, I'm going to let you take these formulas and run with them based on your experience with integration from the prior chapter. And let me know if you have any questions.